first four speakers that I have are Mike Person, Linda Martin, Jay Parrish, and Aaron Haynes. We make it. Uh, good evening. I am uh, appreciative of this effort uh, this evening and anxious to begin a discussion of the environmental impact of a pipeline in Lancaster County. My name is Mike Burson. I am the CEO of the Lancaster County Conservancy. The Conservancy exists because clean air, fresh water, and wild places are vital to every Lancaster County generation. The public preserves, which would be impacted by the initial proposed primary route in southern Lancaster County, Shanks Ferry Wildflower Preserve, and Tuckwan Glen were acquired with public funds, are permanently deed restricted and open to the public for recreation 365 days a year, dawn to dusk at no charge, are enjoyed by thousands of visitors each year, are some of the most, are, are some of the last remaining forested lands in Lancaster County, and are held by the Lancaster County Conservancy for public benefit. This initial southern route passed through the Susquehanna Riverlands or River Hills. This unique part of Lancaster County along the Susquehanna River is home to one of the highest rated bird habitats, eagle nests, and hiking trails. Preservation efforts have saved thousands of acres of mature, healthy forests and watersheds. The Lancaster County Conservancy's role is to protect our natural resources proactively for the benefit of our whole community. With the help of residents and businesses in the county, we remain steadfast in our role as a guardian of land and water. For that reason this evening <clears throat> and for that responsibility, we are here to present and testify on behalf of clean air and clean water in Lancaster County. You may not be passionate about hiking, biking, running, fishing, hunting, bird watching, wildlife, connecting with nature, all of which would be impacted by a pipeline, but at a basic level, one must be concerned about air and water we use. Lancaster County is a microcosm of a much larger ecosystem that we do here affects our immediate environment. The more trees we have in the county, the cleaner our air and water. Lancaster County has less than 15% forested land. We cannot afford to eliminate large stands of mature trees clear cut for a pipeline corridor which will not be replaced or permitted for regeneration. In 2014, the State of Air report from the American Lung Association gave Lancaster an F for its ground level ozone. The Lancaster area is considered 33rd worst in the nation for ozone levels. The River Hills contains a rugged and in some cases isolated terrain. A pipeline related accident in this region could be catastrophic. Access to the homes, families, and natural resources in this area would be a difficult task. The River Hills contains many tributaries in the Susquehanna River. Stormwater runoff, sediment, erosion created by construction of a pipeline will impact our drinking water source, the Susquehanna River, in addition to the downstream impact of the Chesapeake Bay. I am encouraged by an opportunity to testify regarding the environmental impact of a pipeline in the River Hills in Lancaster County. Just as I was encouraged to see FERC when you moved heaven and earth to protect the River Hills in 2012, just two years ago. That was a landmark effort. This was a collective effort by local, state, and national proportion. You need to wrap up your comments, please. Thank you. I am urging FERC not to permit the devastation of this region you once protected. Good evening, my name is Lydia Martin, L-Y-D-I-A-M-A-R-T-I-N, and I'm an education specialist and land steward with the Lancaster County Conservancy. I also volunteer with the Penn State Master Gardener Program, focusing on pollinator conservation, and I'm enrolled in the PA Master Naturalist Program. I'm in agreement with Mike Burson's comments and would like to add the following. 
You've just heard the importance of this issue to the global environment, our environment in Lancaster County. I would like to talk to you about the implications of a proposed pipeline in the Susquehanna River Hills region from an on-the-ground perspective. Not only would a proposed pipeline fragment the existing landscape, causing unnecessary pressure on endangered and threatened species, but it, was all, it would also impact public and private individuals and organizations who share a similar vision and belief in, protect, in protecting natural lands. Permanent habitat loss due to human activities is the main reason why plants and animals become threatened, endangered, or extinct. This indirectly affects our universities, students, and other members of the public who use those preserves as outdoor classrooms to study species diversity. Since 1969, the Conservancy has partnered with school districts, private schools, colleges, and universities, such as Franklin and Marshall College and Millersville University in environmental education. Since the proposed pipeline's final location has not yet been confirmed, I would like to comment and stress the importance of protecting Shanks Ferry Wildflower Preserve and Tukwang Glen Nature Preserve. These two preserves alone encompass 441 acres of the 22 current preserves in the River Hills region. Both preserves are dominated by a forested canopy that serves to protect a vast array of wildlife species. A constructed pipeline will result in permanent fragmentation of what that will lead to further degradation of the environment. This increases levels of erosion, which impacts water quality, as well as um, water quality that eventually leads to issues with the Susquehanna River and eventually the Bay. Increased pollution levels from general maintenance along the pipeline, such as mowing and pesticide use to manage invasive species. I would like to share several examples of environmental, of ed educational and recreational uses of our preserves. In spring 2009, the Conservancy hosted a birdathon with the Lancaster County Bird Club. Nearly 100 species of birds were documented on nine preserves in the River Hills region. Up to 70 species were identified in a single day's observation. Birding with orthonologists and experts provide a unique educational, recreational, and economic benefit to our community. Bird surveys like this are repeated on our preserves annually on, in small and large scales. Secondly, um, in addition to the birds, we also address aquatic species as well as um, amphibians and reptiles. A 10-year... A 10-year citizen project is underway to inventory amphibians and reptiles in Pennsylvania. And i just like to say that even though I didn't get to finish the rest of my comments, there's a huge impact to the natural resources in the River Hills region. So I thank you for allowing me to comment and hope that you would consider preserving the River Hills region and not moving the route back. Dr. Jay Parrish, J-A-Y-P-A-R-R-I-S-H. I'm the former state geologist of Pennsylvania. From 2001 to 2010, I was the state official responsible for the study of geology in the state, and I'm currently a registered professional geologist in Pennsylvania. I support the comments offered by Mike Burson of Lancaster County Conservancy and offer the following additional comments. I've tried to prepare comments on how the geology of Lancaster County would impact the siting of the Williams Pipeline, but unfortunately it's proven impossible to obtain GIS files, Geographic Information System files, showing the proposed route from Williams. I would strongly encourage you to require companies such as Williams to provide an accurate digital GIS file for scientists and planners to use. On un as a result, I'm unable to overlay the necessary geologic information on the route. The illustration provided to Lancaster newspapers was prepared at an unknown scale and accuracy, and I'm disappointed in Williams' lack of transparency in this regard. Given the limitation of not knowing the exact route of the pipeline, in general it is evident the proposed route goes through a portion of the state with several geologic hazards which could easily be avoided. The western portion of Lancaster County is one of the most seismically active areas in the state. While the magnitudes of Pennsylvania seismic events are relatively small, why route a pipeline through one of the very, very few places in the state which does have activity? For example, see Roger Fails' 2007 epicenter map published by the Geologic Survey, Map 69. In 2007, there was a 3.4 magnitude quake near, uh, occurred near Salunga. 
it's very likely that this was due to movement on the east-west fault described by Wise and Gannis in the prospect quarry. The location of the proposed pipeline would appear to be between the quarry and the epicenter, one of the very few places in Pennsylvania where there is known to be seismic activity. The Marnickville area is also a seismically active area with a 4.4 event in 1984. This event was shown to have occurred in a north-northwest trending fault and east-northeast axis of compression. So we have two known fault systems with recent activity and the pipeline route hits both of them. While seismic activity in Pennsylvania is nowhere near the magnitude as that of a state such as, a Pens as California, why, given the complete lack of known epicenters in most of southern Pennsylvania, would a company choose to locate a pipeline where there is activity? In terms of risk management, this is going to form going from a near zero chance of activity to a finite risk. If Williams would still like to pursue a southern Pennsylvania pipeline, I would suggest they wait for the Nor National Science Foundation Earth, Earth Scope and PA size data set to be released next year so they can see actual seismic activity measured statewide from a network of modern seismometers. Likewise, they should examine the 2009 Bureau of Topographic and Geologic Survey's seismic reflection line, which roughly parallels the route. This data should be enhanced and analyzed for evidence of the wise Gannis fault. And likewise, low altitude magnetic data should be acquired along the, the, the area. Uh, additionally, a deep well would be useful in um, defining the seismic velocities to process the seismic data. There's a significant sinkhole activity in south central Pennsylvania. Uh, regions to the west lack the same intensity. If you look at Kochanoff and Reese's 2003 map published by the Pennsylvania Geologic Survey, map 68. The Epler formation in particular is very prone to sinkholes. It appears the pipeline would cross this formation. Again, why site a pipeline over a known geologic hazard when there are many reasons to southern Pennsylvania with little or no sinkhole potential? Uh, I respectfully request that they permanently abandon the pipeline plans for Lancaster, and I thank you for your consideration. Hello, my name is Aaron Ains, and I'm speaking as a certified wildlife biologist as an assistant professor of conservation biology here at Millersville University. We welcome you as an alumnus. Welcome back. I thank you for this opportunity to share my thoughts with you and the importance of maintaining the River Hills ecosystem of Lancaster County, which includes Shanks Ferry Wildflower Preserve and the Taquan Glen Nature Preserve. In addition, I would like to make it known that I support the comments offered by Mike Burson and the speakers before me. And thus, below I'll offer some additional comments and why I support an alternate route that would avoid the River Hills ecosystem. Um, I teach many more courses out there, mammalogy, ornithology, conservation biology. Um, it's a great opportunity to have a free outdoor lab um, with budget cuts in the education system. It's really nice to have these facilities nearby. Um, in these areas, we do a lot of hands-on, applied learning. Obviously, uh, we also do a lot of service learning. So not only are students doing in the field, they're collecting data, and that data is being used by other entities for conservation purposes. So it's a great area to learn. Now while in these areas, specifically the River Hills ecosystem, and including areas such as Shanks Ferry and Tuckwan Glen, the students and I discuss the benefits that this ecosystem has and the services it provides to the local community. Albeit at a small scale, the Lancaster River Hills ecosystem provides important ecosystem services, and ecosystem services are defined as free services provided to the public of Lancaster County by these biological systems. Uh, these services include air quality, improvement of air quality, the dissipating of the kinetic energy of storm runoff to lessen the flow of sediment and the filtering of agricultural pollutants from entering the Susquehanna River, and thus benefiting the Sh uh, Chesapeake Bay, which benefits local fisheries and their businesses, the vegetative communities of the River Hills system also is the herbicide and pesticide free habitat. And that free habitat provides a source habitat for many invertebrates, which are important pollinators for many of our agricultural neighbors. This is important for the uh, county of Lancaster because many of them are ag-based and they rely on these free pollinators. Also the shade provided by these forests provide cool streams. Cool streams increase oxygen levels for species such as our native brook trout as well as benefit native trout and brown trout for fishermen and fisherwomen, such as my, well, I'm not a fisherwoman, I'm a fisherman, but my wife and my family include fisherwomen as well. The Lancaster River Hills ecosystem and the wetlands within also provide important breeding habitat for many species of um, reptiles, amphibians, birds, and mammals. Many neotropical species of birds breed on the river hills, and many more migratory birds follow the Susquehanna River back and forth in the mountains of Pennsylvania and use the River Hills ecosystem as an important stopover habitat during migration. Based on the Pennsylvania Game Commission and the Pennsylvania Boat Commission webpages, 
the geographic ranges of the following state listed species overlap the River Hills ecosystem. These species include the black crowned night herring, peregrine falcons, osprey, rough green snakes, and the eastern red bellied turtle. Most importantly, the federally listed species, bog turtle, which is under the Endangered Species Act, is geographic range also overlaps this area. So that needs to be considered. A pipeline that intersects the River Hills ecosystem will inevitably impact these wildlife species, mainly in the form of fragmentation. And fragmentation, what it does is it breaks up habitat for these areas and makes these species more susceptible to predation, disease, parasites. And because these pipelines are sprayed with herbicides, fragmentation will not disappear over time. So these areas are enjoyed by thousands of visitors, local families, sportsmen, sportswomen, fishermen, fisherwomen, students from pre-K to postgraduate. We ask you to consider this when looking at this pipeline project. Thank you so much for your time. Good evening. At, oh, my own. Yeah. Good evening, and it's uh, it's I, I'm 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 very pleased that I could be in front of you guys and, and make some comments. I'm with the represent the Donegal chapter of Trout Unlimited, and our 750 members that we have here in the county. Our main purpose, our sole purpose, is to protect and enhance our cold water resources that we have here in Lancaster County. Um, the uh, the all. The Atlantic uh, Sunrise Project has depicted on maps to cross some of Lancaster County's most important trout streams. Little Cheeky's Creek is an approved trout water. Climber's Run, which has native brown and brook trout in it, and we just recently spent $80,000 down there on doing its stream improvement projects where the proposed pipeline will be going across. Tuckwan Tuck Glen is another wild trout stream and Fishing Creek is designated as high value, high quality by the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. Erosion and sedimentation streaming from pipeline development can greatly impact the high quality trout habitat as well as fertilized eggs within the system. We're also concerned about the proper water flow on reds, thus affecting a year's class of juvenile trout fry. Uh, fry. Also, removal of vegetation along the riparian corridor where stream crossings might happen could also impact negatively with thermal pollution uh, because of the elimination of the shade. In 2011, in Pine Creek up in uh, Tioga County, severe, uh, severe turbidity uh, was resulted from uh, the improper uh, vegetation clearing from the El Paso pipeline in Potter County. And that's caused a major siltation problem. So crossing over our highest quality streams should be avoided at all costs. Those that can't be avoided should employ vigorous construction and post-construction erosion and sediment control practices. Donegal TU should be among the groups consulted in the mitigation process as we've already been involved with the erosion, with the extension project from Buck, Pennsylvania to Cecil County by Perennial Environmental Services in Houston and the Army Corps of Engineers. Thank you for your time. Thank you, good evening. Uh, my name is spelled M-I-N-N-I-C-H, and I am the chairman of the board of the Lancaster County Conservancy. I too, of course, agree with the comments made earlier by Mike Burson, our CEO. We realize that the uh, new primary route of the pipeline avoids uh, some of our natural preserves in the River Hills, but we also realize that it uh, could very well be the uh, alternate. 
One of our volunteers and land stewards, a Dr. John R. Ambler, is a uh, biology professor retired from Millersville University. Dr. Ambler was unable to attend this meeting but did write a short paper on the protection of exceptional assemblage of natural plants that I would like to read. I am a biologist and one of the volunteer land stewards for Tukwon Glen Nature Preserve. I have been working there since 1998 to protect the native plants and improve the quality of visitor experience by maintaining trails and removing invasive plants. The River Hill Creek Valley is called glens and surrounding terrain are special areas for native plants and animals. They have rich soils, a mild climate, and a diverse habitat favoring an exceptional assemblage of natural plants. I have examined records of plant specimens in the North Museum and Millersville University herbaria, the places where botanists keep specimens for future study. In the Lancaster County Hills, east of the Susquehanna River, at least 700 different native plants have been found, one-third of the native, native plants in all of Pennsylvania. There are records of many rare plants in this area, including many Pennsylvania species of special concern, with the following Pennsylvania Biological Society rankings, 31 endangered, 9 rare, 18 threatened plants, 3 plants vulnerable to exploitation, 6 uh, plants uh, rarity status under evaluation, and 5 extirpated plants. Also, there are 30 plants with special populations in the River Hill area. The serpentine areas in the southern part of the county also have additional rare plants. Environmental review of the development project by the Pennsylvania Department of Natural Resources, DCNR, is valuable in helping protect known locations of rare plants. However, most locations of rare plants, due to inadequate surveys and locations on private property, are not recorded by DCNR. Non-invasive plants are serious concerns for natural areas. Invasive plants need to be minimized to protect native plant population in areas to maintain great scenic value. The power line rights of way contain major concentrations of invasive plants such as Japanese stiltgrass and so forth. Most of the forested land in Leicester County has been converted to agriculture and various developments. The remaining 15% needs to be protected as much as possible, especially in the fine nature preserves of the River Hills. Running a pipeline through these areas is highly undesirable. All in all, the pipeline should not be put through the hills directly east of the Susquehanna River in Lancaster County. A great amount of effort and financial resources by individuals by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania have gone to protecting portions of the River Hills from development. I urge you also to help protect these areas. Thank you. My name is Tim Spies, T-I-M-S-P-I-E-S-E, -E. and I'd like to thank you to, for the opportunity to speak tonight. And I think I am the first person that's speaking without everything written down, so here we go. Uh, I'd like to make a couple points and um, hopefully stay within my three minutes. The first one being at the open house, I believe in Lebanon that I attended, I was speaking with Mario DiCocco, and I brought up the, uh, the issue that on Williams' website, they still have as a possibility uh, the existing Transco rights away that exists now. They also have it as a, as a possibility to do nothing. Those are both still on their website. And so I asked Mario, I said, why are you not doing an environmental impact study on that existing right of way corridor? And after talking with him, he said, and I'm going to paraphrase because I have a full time job and I can't remember all this stuff, but he said something to the effect of, we may have to do that. So I went over and talked to Bart Jensen with, uh, with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And after talking to him, he said, and I quote, because I do remember this word for word, yes, they will have to do that. They were his words. Yes, they will have to do that. Now, what I'm asking is, is was he speaking out of turn? If not, if that is a correct statement for him to have made, when will the study begin? Because right now, I don't trust, right now, Williams is saying it's too much of an environmental impact. It's too much of an economic impact, whatever. Until I see the proof, I would request that they would be required to do the same study there that they're doing through the, the proposed pipeline route now. 
I, I think that's required of them if I'm reading between the lines with the law and, what, and, and uh, following existing infrastructure and rights of way. If I'm wrong, I apologize, but that's my understanding. So I would request that they do that. Uh, secondly, I also uh, know that FERC has been criticized recently with a uh, circuit court ruling that you're not doing enough. I know we're here to talk about a pipeline, but what I would like to, for everyone to consider, including you, is upstream and downstream of that pipeline. Particularly tonight, I'd like to talk about upstream of that pipeline. Recently, the EPA basically said, we can't keep up. We, we, we haven't been able to keep up with the fracturing, the hydraulic fracturing, and the natural gas industry in Pennsylvania. We can't keep up. We don't even know what's going on. Uh, there are, whether people want to accept it or not, there are people that are getting sick. There are people that their water is compromised. WJL recently reported that there are now 23 counties in Pennsylvania whose water sources have been compromised by hydraulic fracturing of natural gas in the Marcellus Shale region. This is something you must consider when approving this pipeline. The impacts of what's going on upstream, I know you don't regulate that, but you must consider that with this project. The last thing I'd like to mention is one very specific concern. I've been hearing a lot about uh, Williams will do a hydraulic or hydrostatic test of the pipeline. I looked on their website and they say we do hydrostatic or an air test. I'm in the construction business so I understand a lot about both of these. I did the calculations for a hydrostatic test. A one mile section of 42 pipeline contains 1.1 million gallons of water. I know they'll be allowed to get that from the river. Someone will give them permission to pump that. How will they discharge that water when they're done doing their hydrostatic test? in the correct, proper manner, given that the Susquehanna River, we're trying to keep it from dying, and we're trying to bring the Chesapeake Bay back. How are they going to discharge 1.1 million gallons of water from one mile of pipeline after they conduct their hydrostatic test? That's something to consider also. Thank you very much. Does it matter which one I talk into? This way? Oh, okay. I want to talk into, into the correct one. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I'm Dr. Nancy Jeffries. I'm a family doctor here in Lancaster County since 1988. Um, I've spent my career taking care of the health and well-being of Lancastrians, including delivering 1,200 babies, adding to the population here in Lancaster. Um, there's an interesting thing in Lancaster where the families go on for generations and you're not considered a local unless you're fourth, fifth, sixth generation Lancaster. And so there's a lot of pride in um, Lancaster and in being a Lancastrian and I feel very honored to have been accepted into this community. My husband and I moved from Ephrata to um, Conestoga and we had an environmental study done prior to moving, a phase one environmental assessment report, because we were concerned about what we were getting into. Um, this study showed that Conestoga was on the Mardic Fault, that there was severe fracturing and cracking consistent with seismic activity, the soil was very acidic, and that any infrastructure would need to be specially treated. It also showed Conestoga limestone as part of the geology, um, which was very susceptible to sinkholes. Um, I have some papers here. I have one, you can't see it real well, but it shows the seismic activity and it's all right around where the pipeline would be. Um, this is where it shows where the sinkholes are and it shows extensive sinkhole. Um, and I can give these copies um, to you. It also stated that um, the boulder field starts around 30 feet 30 inches under the topsoil. I questioned at the Williams meeting if whether or not there would be any demolition, and I was told no. And I said, well, if the boulders start 30 inches below and you have a 42-inch pipeline, what are you going to do with the boulders? And I was referred to someone else who referred me to someone else, and I never did get an answer to my question. But the entire geology, it's 30 inches of topsoil, and then there are boulders that are showing fracturing and cracking from extensive seismic activity. Um, this concerns me, again, um, as a physician. I'm also concerned 
with the uh, Conestoga Volunteer Fire Company and their disaster management um, as to how they would be equipped. Um, I think it's unrealistic to expect a volunteer fire company to be equipped um, to deal with an environmental disaster. And uh, again, as a family physician, I just have sincere concerns about the air, water quality, um, and the, um, the, the quality of the pipe. So thank you. Hey, good evening. My name is Mark Clatterbuck. I live in Mardick Township in Southern Lancaster County, uh, and I'm a founding member of the community group called Mardick Soul, and also uh, a landowner directly affected by uh, one of the proposed routes uh, through my township. Sorry it took a while to, to make it up here. You wouldn't believe the drag on that 42-inch circle. <laughs> uh, my, comment, my comment is a straightforward one. I simply want to go on record, noting the widespread, passionate, and still swelling opposition that this proposed project has sparked across our local communities. I understand that the purpose of this scoping hearing is to help FERC identify the criteria to be used in its environmental impact statement. This includes any issue that is, quote, historic, cultural, economic, social, or health related. But where is the category that reads the will of the local community? In our township, and no doubt in many others as well, the great majority of directly affected landowners emphatically oppose PF 14-8. But where does this opposition fall within your rubric? The fact that the will of a local community is difficult to measure with scientific precision does not mean that it should be ignored altogether in your considerations. Bog turtles and Indiana bats are also elusive, but you're still spending quality time looking for them. Local community opposition against this project is as real as those turtles and bats. Why else would thousands of us here in Lancaster County be spending our evenings, our weekends, our work breaks, and sleepless nights organizing, carting our bleary-eyed children around with us to township meetings and scoping hearings like this one till 10 o'clock at night, calling our government officials, writing letters to you all at FERC, and desperately trying to turn ourselves into experts on issues we'd rather not be spending our time on. In the five short months since survey crews began knocking on our doors, community opposition to this project has grown broad, deep, increasingly well-informed, and very real. Here's one final indicator to add to your files. Several communities in Lancaster County are right now drafting local ordinances challenging the right of a private corporation and of the federal government itself to force a project onto our land against our will that we, the local community, regard as an unequivocal harm. This is no small feat considering that each of these community-based ordinance efforts represents thousands of combined hours stolen from the lives of local residents who just want this project to go away. Tonight, we in Marduk and Conestoga and every other township along this proposed line are asking you to undertake a formal accounting of the will of the local communities who are most directly affected by this project. If this category receives the weight it deserves, PF 14-8 doesn't have a prayer and we can get our lives back. Thank you.
Good evening. My uh, last name is spelled uh, W-H-E-A-T-O-N. I am speaking as a member of the Land Protection Committee for the Lancaster County Conservancy. My qualifications include a bachelor's in chemical engineering and a master's in environmental engineering. In addition to over 15 years experience in the propane industry. I support the comments offered by Mike Burson, uh, the CEO of the Lancaster County Conservancy, and offer the following additional comments. I have several major safety and environmental concerns about the proposed Williams Gas Transmission Pipeline. First, this pipeline is designed as a 42-inch diameter and to operate at 1,500 psi or pounds per square inch, which is the largest size and greatest pipeline operating pressure in the United States for a pipeline. By comparison, a propane tank is designed to operate at 250 pounds per square inch, which is only 17% pressure of this transmission um, operating pressure. A 42-inch pipeline can transport over 8,000 MCF, which is a million cubic feet, of natural gas per day. In contrast, according to the U.S. Energy Information Administration data for 2013, Pennsylvania consumers use an average of 2,516 MCF per day, which is only 30% of the entire proposed pipeline estimated capacity. According to the pipeline emergencies document developed jointly by the National Association of State Fire Marshals and the U.S. Department of Transportation's Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, the natural gas transported in transmission pipelines, such as the proposed Atlantic Sunrise Pipeline, is typically not odorized. That's in contrast to most gases that are odorized, such as propane and natural gas when they're in local distribution systems. If a leak were ever to develop, a bystander would not be able to smell the natural gas and would not be warned of an impending fire danger. According to the same document called Pipeline Emergencies, the single greatest cause of gas transmission pipeline accidents is corrosion from both internal or external sources, um, so I'm just using sections of the pipe. My question is, what specific pro uh, programs does Williams use to prevent all sources of corrosion? In addition, some existing pipelines have transported a number of different chemicals over the years, depending on market conditions. Chlorine gas, which is highly toxic, is illegally transported in major U.S. pipelines. The proposed 42-inch pipeline requires a 50-foot permanent easement in addition to temporary construction easement. The public uh, preserves which would be impacted by the proposed pipeline construction in Southern Lancaster County, including Shanks Ferry and the Tuckwan Glen Preserve, are some of the last remaining forested lands in Lancaster County. And I will wrap this up. If this pipeline were to be constructed in these areas, the forest land would be extremely negatively impacted from the clear cutting of all trees and other vegetation during this um, construction maintenance of the pipeline. Further, Regular low helicopter surveillance of pipeline easements is required and will also negatively impact the peaceful serenity of these lands. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you for welcoming me today to speak and giving this opportunity. My name is Carlos Big White Wolf. I am the Principal Chief of the Maokanuka Taino Indian Nation and Vice President of the American Indian Movement of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. My message to you today is simple. Stop destroying Mother Earth. We do not need it. The people here do not want this, neither do we. As I said back there, waiting to speak, a few other people here came up to me and told me how Native American artifacts have been found in their land, meaning this is sacred land. Don't mess with sacred land. We will not have it. This is not your land that they're hitting. They're our land, and we don't want it. We're sick of it. The American Indian Movement since 1968 have been known as an advocacy organization that has fought against anyone with the idea and the project to destroy our land. And here today, I make you a promise. If this project continues, the American Indian Movement will, will take land that will fight, we will go up against anyone who tries to destroy our land. We will occupy. You will not do this project. You're going to have to run your bulldozers right through us. But we will not give Mother Earth without a fight. Uh -huh.
Good evening. My name is Laura Finberg, F-I-N-B-E-R-G. It's very difficult for me to speak in public, but I will do it because I believe what I have to say is important. I live in Lakewood Estates, which is a small development off Red Hill Road in Mardick Township. Our development has two exits, both of which would be crossed by this pipeline, effectively sealing off over 150 families. We would have no access to get out, and emergency personnel would have no way to get in. The area is, excuse me, due to the topography, the area, and the high incidence of seismic activity, I believe this is a terrible location for this pipeline. The southern end of Lancaster County is a national treasure and should be preserved. The Susquehanna River is one of the three oldest rivers in the world and one of the most endangered. Our farms are among the most beautiful and protected, I mean, and productive in the world. And I beg you to keep this pipeline from impacting the southern end of Lancaster County, our woods, our river, our homes, and the beautiful Amish farms that, by the way, are the cornerstone of a $2.5 billion industry. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Elaine Ash, and my last name is spelled E-S-C-H. First of all, I'd like to state that I'm in agreement with everyone who spoke this evening in opposition to this pipeline. I would also like to make the distinction tonight between the entire Atlantic Sunrise pro um, Project and the Central Penn South Pipeline. Central Penn South is just one portion of the Atlantic Sunrise Project and the, the part that I particularly oppose. I'm trying to decide whether to read this or just speak, but um, I have submitted these written um, comments to FERC directly, so you will have record of them. So I believe I'll just speak um, a little more loosely. On William's website, I found this map that shows the constrained area that they wish to address, and I hope that you all, as a crowd, are familiar with this. Um, the Transco pipelines both go through um, Pennsylvania already, and they connect to New Jersey. And what I would like to address in my comments tonight is that there is another way, rather than having 177 miles of Greenfield pipeline through Pennsylvania. We do not need this. Williams does not need this, frankly. If you look closely at this map, um, it shows the bottleneck that they say that they wish to address. And indeed, if you look at the different stations, they go down from five pipelines into some stations down to as small as one pipeline between stations 505 and 210. I would like to suggest that instead of Greenfield Pipeline, Williams would try to do the equivalent of building more lanes on an existing highway and add capacity only between the stations that lack capacity, rather than destroying uh, over 2,700 acres of land that has never had an easement or never had a pipeline through it. I feel like it is totally unnecessary. Uh, this is a sensible a sensible solution. Um, it is a way that Williams could get the capacity that they say they desire. It is also a way that the northeast markets of the United States would have access to the natural gas. Uh, this past year in Boston, uh, we had uh, crisis level shortages of natural gas. 
on the pipeline that they're currently proposing to cut down through central Pennsylvania would completely circumvent these markets um, so that gas would, would not even be going out to the eastern seaboard. I'd also like to suggest, and it's documented, um, that the key purpose of this pipeline as it exists, this proposal, is to transport a huge amount of gas to the Cove Point um, export facility in Maryland. On their, they, they've been hesitant to, to comment on this at the open houses and so forth, but if you look on their website at some of the PowerPoints that they have for their investors, you'll clearly see that when they list the key delivery points, Cove Point is number one. And on the maps that they give, And on the maps that they give, which I will also submit with my comments, access to Cove Point Pipeline is prominently listed as one of the best features of this project. Perhaps if we're only looking at the profits of one company, this makes sense. Um, certainly they can make more money with 20-year contracts to India and Japan than they could make just transporting gas to the eastern seaboard. But if you look at the bigger picture and the cost that that has to our community and to Pennsylvania as a whole, I would like to suggest that this does not deserve your approval and it does not deserve eminent domain, which would rest on our shoulders. So in conclusion, I ask FERC to deny the portion of the Atlantic Sunrise Program called the Central Penn South Pipeline. It does not appear to provide benefit to the landowners of PA nor the markets of the north, Northeast and should not qualify for eminent domain. There are other options available to Williams and they should utilize existing easements to achieve their goals rather than add greenfield pipelines. Thank you. My name is Dr. Tim Trussell. I'm a professor of archaeology at Millersville University. I've worked as a professional archaeologist for 25 years and have spent the last 10 years as a professor at Millersville excavating and studying sites in Lancaster County. It is my considered opinion that if this pipeline is built anywhere within Manor, Conestoga, or Marduk Townships, the resulting destruction of archaeological sites and Native American burials will be a public relations disaster for Williams and Furt. Conestoga, Manor, and Marduk Townships contained the highest population and density of Native American settlement anywhere in the entire state of Pennsylvania. The largest individual villages in all Pennsylvania prehistory were, along the, the, were the palisaded settlements along the Susquehanna River. To put it very clearly, this area is Pennsylvania's Valley of the Pharaohs. This is our Machu Picchu. There is literally nowhere else in the entire state that contains a greater concentration of archaeological sites, features, artifacts, or human burials. The proposed pipeline route runs directly through or adjacent to seven major archaeological sites that are already on the National Register. In addition, there were literally hundreds of smaller settlements and villages spread throughout these townships. We find archaeological materials in virtually every farmer's field, from Route 30 in the north to Silver Spring Road at the end of your project. What this means is that you cannot simply move the proposed route a few hundred feet to avoid a site. Now, you may believe that you are doing archaeological survey and therefore you can locate these sites and burials ahead of time. Unfortunately, this is not at all true. Though URS is an outstanding company, the survey methodology they are being forced to use on this project calls for a single, little one-by-one -one foot shovel test pit every 50 feet along the route. If the area of potential effect is just 10 feet on either side of that, what that means is that only one of every 10,000 square feet of soil to be disturbed is being tested archaeologically. The likelihood of a one ten thousandth sample finding something as small as a grave is infinitesimal. But once the bulldozers run, I guarantee you will find those burials. And when skulls and femurs are being kicked up by your equipment, there will be a firestorm of public outrage. As of today, 
As of today, you cannot claim ignorance of the probability of destroying cultural resources through this project. Professional archaeologists and Native American rights groups who are already being contacted will make certain that any such destruction of archaeological resources or human burials will be national news. And it will not be the type of news that either Williams or FERC will welcome. I sincerely hope, I sincerely hope, that, frankly, that it doesn't come to that and that you consider an alternate route that does not run straight through the single densest, most important archaeological district anywhere in the entire state of Pennsylvania. Thank you. My name is Mindy Roy. My last name is spelled R-O-Y-E. I have been a resident of West Penfield Township for 30 years. I also lived in Mardikville, which is Mardik Township. 1984, I married my husband from Columbia. His family has ancestors of Native American Indians, possibly Susquehannock. According to her stories, as she was a child from her parents, a lot of the Indians that lived along the Susquehanna River come up to the area of Indian Head Road, Fairview, Kinderhook and Ironville Pike did the ore mines. So as you can see through the generations of the Native American Indians, they created our underground natural springs that is in our area. I also would like to say that after the Native Americans lost their land. William Penn, one of our founding fathers, had seven sons. Each son had 100 acre partial lots in Lancaster County. Our property, yes, it is a mobile home park and it only has eight residents. We are sitting on one of those 100 acre lots that William Penn's, one of his sons had. I would like to say, ask, if there is any cause of any illness, contaminations, and or explosions, who receives the monetary monies if this happens? if this pipeline is put through. It does not benefit anybody because it is not used as a utility. I say, leave our land alone. Good evening, my name is Craig Lehman. C-R-A-I-G-L-E-H-M-A-N. I currently serve on the Lancaster County Board of Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts on the proposed Atlantic Sun Sunrise Project. I respectfully request that you do not issue a certificate of public convenience and necessity that includes the Central Penn South portion of the Atlantic Sunrise Project and instead substitute the Transco Looping CPL South alternative. Since the Transco pipeline already has connectivity to the main line near Station 195 in southeastern Pennsylvania, this approach would result in an expansion and upgrade of the existing Transco pipeline and eliminate the currently proposed Greenfield pipeline segment through Columbia, Lancaster, Lebanon, Northumberland, and Schuylkill counties. I recommend this expand and upgrade approach to the proposed pipeline primarily because there is existing connectivity, but also because it is consistent with Lancaster County's targeted approaches toward development and growth farmland preservation, and transportation. I offer three examples of how our community is working to maximize the use of existing infrastructure and resources. First, Lancaster County and partner municipalities have established urban and village growth areas. 
These were established as places where the community wants to target development and growth. The idea is to keep our older communities healthy and desirable places to live while reducing development and growth pressures on agricultural, natural, and rural lands. As a result, Lancaster County has continued to benefit from economic growth while maintaining its small county feel and reputation. Second, we have made a huge investment in farmland preservation as a targeted way to ensure the sustainability of our agriculture industry. As a result, Lancaster County is number one in the nation with more than 100,000 acres preserved. While more work needs to be done, we are on our way to ensuring that agriculture remains vital well into the future. Third, limited transportation funding, even with the recent addition of new state dollars, has meant that the county has had to be strategic on how transportation resources are utilized. Instead of funding large-scale capacity adding projects, resources have been targeted toward projects that improve the efficiency and effectiveness of our existing transportation system. One effort currently underway is the Multi-Municipal Corridor Signalization Project to help improve traffic flow and reduce congestion in selected high-volume corridors in Lancaster County. As you can see, all of these efforts are targeted and all focus on maximizing the use of existing infrastructure and resources. I personally believe the same approach should be employed as it relates to the proposed Atlantic Sunrise Project. Finally, I respectfully remind FERC that we are in the midst of a natural gas gold rush. As with past gold rushes, there are benefits like jobs, and in this case, potentially reduced natural gas prices for some consumers. As with, with all gold rushes, there are also corporate profits, and in some cases motivated by greed, and in some instance, instances blinded by hubris. However, with virtually every gold rush, there is a cost, there is a future cost. Many times those costs show up in unintended consequences. They may be environmental, they may be societal, they may even be economic as the, as the rush event inevitably goes from boom to bust. With these in things in mind, I strongly encourage FERC to take a conservative approach to all new greenfield capacity added projects, especially when connectivity already exists. Thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts on the proposed Atlantic Sunrise Project. I again respectfully request that you do not issue a certificate of public convenience and necessity that includes the Central Penn South portion of the proposed Atlantic Sunrise Project and instead substitute the Transco Looping CPL South alternative to eliminate the currently proposed Greenfield Pipeline segment through Col Columbia, Lancaster, Lebanon, Northumberland, and Schuylkill counties. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this chance to talk tonight. Uh, my name is Linda Pyle, and I'm not a, really a speaker, but I'm very concerned about this pipeline. It's um, crossing the road and going to include all the land on our farm. And I have some major issues, and one of them is safety. Like I was looking up Williams's record, and I know the gentleman there was saying that he checks into the safety, but they've had a lot of accidents. And my question is, like if, heaven forbid, but if the pipeline were on the alternate route would go through and there would be an explosion, it'd be close to our barn and our outbuildings, even our house, and we're at the edge of a residential area, who is held responsible if things are damaged or you lose your home? And my other question, too, that I'm about safety is, I heard like the pipe uh, line can go from one to five, and they've chosen with this huge 42 inch pipe to use number two. Well, if you're going in a residential area, why wouldn't you go to the highest to protect it from leaks, corrosion, and things like that? Why go with number two? Because the lowest would be one, so at least we're getting two, but 
I think we should have five. <laughs> and, um, and the other thing that concerns me, and I don't know, like, maybe the federal people should come up with this. I've been keeping track of this thing ever since it started, and I've been writing letters to FERC. How come if, a, if there's a leak, a misitality is notified, and they're told, okay, there's a leak in your water, but we that have independent wells, they don't have to notify us or tell us there's a leak. And water, <laughs> once, once your water's contaminated, there's nothing you can do. You, you've lost that water, and water is a very rare commodity. And that worries me. The safety part worries me, but the water worries me even more. So your committee should look into or make Williams notify people that have independent wells, because we have a right to know. But it seems like they don't want to tell us anything. And that's all I have to say. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. I guess I'm kind of self-centered or whatever. I'm, I'm talking to myself, pertaining to myself, but all these people in this room also. I lived in my life, I grew up in Washington Borough and lived most of my life in West Enfield Township. My house was built before the Civil War. Uh, you'll, you'll hear from Mr. Farry, his house is, his whole property is I think four generations of people. Now the roadway, that's my biggest concern. I mean, the pipeline and everything, but the roadway to build the pipeline. My road is Prospect. It's the north and south corridor that they will use to build this pipeline. It is not designed for the traffic it has now. And my brother-in-laws are both up in Lycoming and Tioga County where they already did fracking. And the, they destroy the roads. I mean, you, if you don't have a four-wheel drive up there, you're just shaking your car apart because they don't, they pass the roads. They don't repair them. They already don't make new ones, I should say. But uh, the people in Mardik and all the Manor Township, all these roads are country roads. They don't go straight and narrow. There's turns, there's dangerous rights left, there's blind intersections and all that stuff. It's going to have people in accidents, it's going to have vehicles into homes. I myself live nine inches off the roadway. I'm in, I'm in an argument with the state trying to move my house. My house was built, like I said, before the Civil War. And if, if anybody goes off the road, they, they plow, they'll go straight through my house. So I'm in, I'm in agreement with all these people. This land is royal and is not made to handle the pipeline, the traffic, or anything that's involved with it. Thank you very much. My name is Bonnie Steckel, that's S-T-O-E-C-K-L. I've been a lifelong resident of Mardik Township, and I'd like to remind the folks at FERC that this permit request you're considering has been filed by Williams Partners, the company with the worst safety and violation record in the industry, for a pipeline of unprecedented size and capacity to cross the Mardik Fault which is a source of regular seismic activity on the magnitude of 4.5 to 5.5 on the Richter scale. Um, and another personal concern is I live in the community of Peckway, a uh, town of 60 families. We all pour our water from the same surface spring, and your original proposed pipeline would pass a uh, quarter of a mile upstream of our only sustainable water source. And I wonder what protection Williams can offer us as a community. Um, also, I wonder, is it true that, that Williams will not be using double wall piping? It's my understanding that the purpose of double wall piping is to contain leaks, to monitor for leaks, and to prevent corrosion of joints. Uh, yet they're not, apparently, they don't feel it's necessary to use that. And. Um, Lastly, I'd like to know if the steel they plan to use for this proposed pipeline is American-made or Korean or Chinese. Thank you.
Thank you for the opportunity of being able to speak this evening. I too am a graduate of Millersville. And if we wouldn't have preserved it, you wouldn't have had a chance. <laughs> I am the senior partner in Far E Farms Partnership, a 348-acre agricultural preserved farm, part of which, which has been in my family for over 150 years. I am Mr. Wirtz's neighbor. We have Indian arrowheads in West Hempfield Township, so the game must have been plentiful at that time for my friend who spoke earlier. We also have something called limonite cubes, which are cubic pieces of rock found primarily only on our farm, <clears throat> which is considered the best place to find them in the United States. I only received my latest map um, on Friday from Williams. Seems a we're going to stop in the middle of one of my fields. Being a preserved farm, we are not allowed any other business except farming. My insurance company and underwriter, contrary to William's comments, consider this pipeline a business <clears throat> with over one mile of proposed pipe. We consider it a danger. No one would allow us to put 352 1,000 gallon propane tanks in line. <clears throat> they only have a 250 pound pressure. We have no place to expand our farming operation because they are taking the only level land we have on the entire 348 acres. Also, one of your proposed routes goes through our springs. We have no wells there. We have three homes and we have two houses uh, housing swine. No wells. What are we going to do? We certainly thank you for your, this opportunity to speak to you. And please remember this is Lancaster County the home of the best unirrigated soil in the nation. Good evening. My name's Michael Shearer, that's S-H-E-A-R-E-R. -E -R. Normally I would be here to speak on behalf of the environmental aspects, but everybody before me has done so wonderfully and I thank you for that. I'm here to speak on the economic aspect for our small company. Our company, Skewpix LLC, owns property along the proposed right-of-way in Lebanon County. Unfortunately, I couldn't be at the meeting tomorrow night. We purchased this lot with the intention of moving two existing facilities to this location and expanding our, our operation. Between Skewpix and our sister company, we currently employ around 300 part-time employees and expect to add several full-time positions in Lebanon County. Our bank has expressed concerns about the inevitable devaluation of our property and said that they may not be able to guarantee adequate financing of our proposed facility should this pipeline right-of-way be granted. Likewise, this uncertainty has forced us to suspend plans for our facility until the issue has been resolved. Because of the many and varied problems potentially caused by a pipeline right-of-way, our bank has advised us to seek legal counsel. We are prepared to see this process through the full eminent domain proceedings in an effort to block it. If our attempts fail, we'll likely remain outside of Lebanon County and may not expand our business as we had intended. This will have a direct and immediate impact on the local economy. 
We expressed these concerns to Williams at the open house in Anvil and were summarily dismissed. We find this unwillingness to listen to the concerns of those impacted by the pipeline to be extremely concerning. Couple that with Williams' lackluster safety record and a perception of misinformation and lacking information, and frankly, we want nothing to do with this project. Lastly, on a personal note, I'm a Williams shareholder. <laughs> I had to buy one. <laughs> It's blatantly obvious that Williams, like any for-profit company, has one goal, provide value to their shareholders, and I admit they do this wonderfully. What they fail to do is provide a direct public benefit. Those of us in Lebanon and Lancaster and all the other counties along the way see, will see no long-term economic benefit from this pipeline. We'll likely see only the degradation of our farmland, devaluation of our properties, the lowering of our tax base and rising energy costs as a result of the pipeline, making it painfully clear that this is not a project for the public benefit and that Williams should not be granted the right of eminent domain under the guise of being a public utility. Thank you. Good evening, I am Steve Murray, and my last name is spelled M-U-R-R-A-Y, Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N. Um, in your opening remarks, Pam, you mentioned the areas that FERC addresses when they're thinking of granting approval to this project, one of which you mentioned was historic preservation. Historic preservation is very important to this community. Um, as one of the previous gentlemen mentioned, um, this county produces more food than any other county in the United States that is not irrigated. The nation depends on us for that food. Just as we as a nation consume gas, oil, coal, and everything else, we have to eat. This is what this community is all about, is farmland preservation and producing food for our nation. One of the amazing things about Lancaster is that you can go anywhere on this planet and say Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and it will conjure up an image in people's mind. You can't say that with Duluth or Phoenix or Waukegan, fill in the blank. Lancaster County conjures up the image of pastoral splendor. The Amish and Mennonite communities here and just how beautiful this place is. We are financially dependent on all of that. We employ thousands and thousands of people. It generates billions and billions and billions of dollars in revenue for us. And having preserved the farmland, we've also been, able, been very lucky in having a really big tourist industry here. We have seven to eight million people who spend in excess of two to three billion dollars a year here. If anything would happen, both of those industries, agriculture and tourism, would really be compromised pretty quickly. Um, one of the things that is a question in my mind is the big picture here. Why are we allowing this private company to export some of our finite, precious energy resources abroad? That doesn't make any sense to me. But I say the red light is on, but the point I want to make and the question that I want to ask FERC is we spent tens of millions of dollars to preserve this farmland, and the, and the tax dollars have come from the county, the state, and the federal government. This must be important to the federal government to preserve this farmland, otherwise they wouldn't be funding it. 
Why would one part of the federal government, FERC, allow a pipeline to be put through a preserved farm to compromise the integrity of that farmland? Why would one branch of the federal government trample on the policy of another part of the federal government? I don't understand that. Thank you for the time. Good evening, my name is Kevin Shelley, and I'm an affected landowner. Uh, my wife Kelly and I own a five and a half acre parcel on Susquehannock Drive, and I wonder where they got that name at. Um, <laughs> and the gas pipeline is gonna come right across the bottom of our property. Uh, we brought this property in 1995, um, thinking it was gonna be our dream home. It's turned into a nightmare. Um, when we bought this property, there was a steep slope ordinance in our township, and we had a small, we're up on, on the, our road is up at the top of a hill when the property slopes to the bottom, uh, and the pipeline is going to be down in the bottom. And we had a small envelope to build our house on. All our stormwater had to run into a leach trench. Um, one of the questions I have is, how does that change, and we can go in and rake my landscape, um, and put a pipeline in. There's a stream at the bottom of our hill uh, that's on our neighbor's properties. I have five neighbors that our property backs onto. The, the, the pipeline isn't on their property, but it's closer to their houses than it is to ours. Uh, and that's concerning too. Um, so I would just wonder how they get away with, you know, coming in. When we're, on a, we're on a very steep hill. Uh, we sled on this hill in the wintertime and you got to bail out at the end because you're going so fast. So if you want to come down, I'm, I'm talking, you know, I don't know what the, the elevation is, but it's, it's like this, okay? So if there is a problem, how are you going to get down in there? Uh, we have volunteer firefighters. They're not going to have the equipment to take care of this. Um, and I just wonder how, how an explosion would be dealt with. We asked Williams over here, if there was a blast, what would be the blast radius? How far is this going to go out? And he had no answer. He said he wanted to refer us to an engineer, and I didn't have the time. I was, you know, I just wanted to get out of there. So, um, <laughs> so the other thing I'd like to address to the audience, has anybody ever witnessed a gas explosion? And if you would, just stand up. Everybody that's witnessed the gas explosion, please stand up. Anybody? Not too many people. In 2005, I was on a construction site when a... Uh, a concrete worker took a bobcat skid loader and knocked a 500 gallon propane tank lid off. I was in the house about from here to that chair away. My initial reaction, it sounded like a, a jet engine going off. So, um, and it was kind of weird, I was down on the floor, I'm a flooring contractor. Um, and I got up and I saw the guy rolling on the ground and apparently the propane had blinded him um, and he was rolling on the ground. My initial reaction was to go get him. Uh, if I would have went and got him, I would not be here speaking to you today because in the count of one, two, three, four, five, that tank exploded. Uh, and what I did, I saw everybody outside working, running away from this, and you can smell the, you can smell the propane, because you can smell the propane, right? Um, so I got out into the driveway, and there was a little garage that protected me from the blast. And believe me, if you've ever seen a movie, this was everything you've seen in a movie. There was a fireball, five stories high, and I could feel the, the heat run up the back of my neck, and it was gone in a flash. And when we went back around the side of the house, it had melted the siding, the, the vinyl siding on this house looked like marshmallow, and on the house beside it. So this was a, this was a local construction company, I'm gonna, not gonna mention her name, but, um, there were no markings around this propane tank at all. They were just little green pots in the ground. And this guy made the mistake, it was human error. He clipped that thing off and he paid for it with his life. He lived two weeks. Um, it blew everything off of him, but his gloves and his boots. And uh, they airlifted him to chest the crozier, but two weeks. So 
you know, that's a, that's a 500 gallon propane tank, okay? And I don't want to live with a 42 inch, however long, pipe bomb on my property. And I'd ask you to, <laughs> to consider that. And I'm also a member of, of Mardic Soul. Um, we've been told by. Okay. I'd like to say we've been told that everything we say here, you'll look at us and shake your head and go, that's nice. And if they dot the I's, cross the T's, this permit will issue. I say we're not going to let that happen. And I'm, I'm really hopeful we have to be here tonight. So thank you very much. Hi, my name is Mike Jennings, J-E-N-N-I-N-G-S. I'm property owner, Rock Hill on the Conestoga River in Manor Township. Uh, you said uh, that the purpose of the meeting was about scope, right? A scoping meeting. Here's what I'd like to ask you guys to do. From my conversations at the beginning of the meeting between the FERC, uh, a couple of FERC uh, representatives, it seems like we have a suboptimized system where FERC looks at environmental impact and construction specification and engineering diagrams and they, they make sure that they look right. Department of DOT takes over after that and is supposed to ensure safety and compliance. I would ask you to widen the scope of the FERC uh, process to include DOT now and consider the operating performance of Transco Williams. It's horrendous. I'd recommend the audience to check on the Kentuckians for the Commonwealth site, ktc.org, and the Pipeline Safety Trust. Since 2002, the KTC website lists 30 incidents. Um, we heard uh, there, was, there was a little bit of disingenuous corporate information given by Ms. Ivey earlier when she said that they adhere to all the regulatory, com uh, that the, they're in regulatory, regulatory compliance because they have letters of citation from the Department of Transportation to, uh, to correct their processes. And I want to just cover a few of these because one of the things in talking to the Williams uh, employees and with some of the FERC employees is that when I mention incidents, nobody knows about them. So 2010, there was a pipeline leak in Texas uh, they didn't find it for four days. In 2011, uh, Transco Williams was fined $275,000 for failing to implement and maintain stormwater measures to prevent potential pollutants from entering the ecosystem during construction at Parachute, Colorado. Interesting place, Parachute, sad place. Uh, 2011, Transco, there was a natural gas pipeline uh, rupture and explosion in Alabama. Eight acres were burnt. The corrosion was not taken care of, and it was not recognized by internal Williams systems. Ga uh, 2012, gas lease explosion at a natural gas compressor station right here in Pennsylvania. Williams restarts the station within 24 hours and started pumping fracked gas, despite requests from the PA Department of Environmental Protection not to do so. Let's keep going. 2012. This is December, the beginning of the pipeline uh, leak in, in Parachute, Colorado. They didn't find it till the next month. They didn't tell the public until March. They've taken 124,000 tons of polluted uh, ground uh, out of Parachute, Colorado. And this, the stream and the groundwater is also contaminated with benzene. So, just in closing, uh, recent uh, court findings are, are really proclaiming that corporations are people, right? Free speech rights and all this. What kind of person is Williams? Is this a person you want in your neighborhood? And I think one other I irony that Steve touched on, that a greedy company is rushing to pump and export a commodity that's depressed in prices because of an oversupply while destroying an irreplaceable commodity or uh, resource, our beautiful Lancaster County farmland.
to make sure everything's great and all that, but what happens when the gas runs out? And these things are just sitting in the ground. They're going to start deteriorating and they're going to cave in and who's going to deal with that? It's going to be stuck with the people that, you know, had to have this stuff put on their land. I don't want e economically priced gas. I want new solutions to our energy crisis. I mean, we're going to pay the price sooner or later. And the longer we stay on, and the longer we stay on fossil fuel, the higher that price is going to be. You know, when we look back a hundred years, we often ask ourselves, you know, what were our ancestors thinking? You know, because some of the decisions they made seem so outlandish. You know, will your grandchildren and, and great-grandchildren feel the same way about your decision? And that, really, I want you, the members of the commission, to go home and ask your children, your grandchildren, you know, the 20-somethings, what's the future of energy? You know, is it jobs fracking and building pipelines? Or is it in jobs in technology fields and finding better ways to produce energy? Thank you. Good evening. My name is Joanne Kilgower, and I serve as the director of the Sierra Club Pennsylvania chapter, and I'm also a resident of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I'm speaking today on behalf of the Pennsylvania chapter of the Sierra Club with concerns about the proposed expansion of the Atlantic Sunrise Project, docket PF 14 8. In Pennsylvania alone, the Sierra Club has more than 24,500 members, with roughly 1,200 in Lancaster County who will be affected by the proposed pipeline. In, ad in addition to those whose daily lives will be directly impacted by this project, our Pennsylvania members share the natural resources that will also be affected. We drink the water, breathe the air, and enjoy the recreational value and ecological integrity of these beautiful lands. As I was listening to all the testimony earlier, I thought about seeding my time because so many of the landowners who have spoken to you here today have spoken eloquently, intelligently, and from the heart. And I think that that, more than anything, demonstrates that this is not in the public interest. Transco is proposing to construct this 177-mile pipeline in Lancaster as part of the Atlantic Sunrise Project, and the construction will potentially disturb thousands of acres of land, including permanent alteration of the county's already limited forest lands and several high-quality and exceptional value waterways. This means that we stand to lose permanently a significant portion of the natural resources that help to maintain human and environmental health throughout the region, resulting in local and downstream impacts. We also stand to lose quality of life for those living upstream in the gas fields, all the way along the pipeline rights of way, and to those living nearby compressor stations and gas processing facilities. The Pennsylvania chapter of the Sierra Club joins the chapter's local Lancaster group in its concern that this pipeline is not in the public interest of the county or the Commonwealth due to the severity of human and environmental impacts that would result. The impacts caused by the construction and operation of the proposed project are collectively significant, and though we have not yet seen any proposed mitigation measures, past proposals have proven insufficient. On July 18th, FERC staff notified the intent of the Commission to conduct an environmental impact statement to evaluate impacts to area residents, threatened and endangered species, wetlands, water bodies, groundwater, fish, vegetation, wildlife, cultural resources, geology, soils, land use, air, and noise quality. We urge the commissioners to conduct a comprehensive environmental review documenting the extent of the impact of each of these areas to adequately account for the cumulative impacts of the project, including those downstream. In addition to all of the other legally required considerations, the consequences outlined in the testimony here today must be adequately addressed in any draft environmental impact statement in order to support a decision under NEPA or the conclusion that the project serves the public interest. Thank you for the opportunity to comment and we appreciate a thorough approach to environmental review. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. My name is Kathy, K-A-T-H-I-E, Shirk, S-H-I-R-K, Gonick. She is in girl, O-N-I-C-K. I'm in-house counsel and director of land protection for Lancaster County Conservancy. My comments are addressed to the proposed southern route of the Atlantic Sunrise Project, Central Penn Line South, 
in Lancaster County referred to as the River Hills Alternative. I support the comments offered by Mike Burson, Lydia Martin, Dr. Tim Trossel, Dick Minnick, Dr. Jay Parrish, Dr. Aaron Haynes, and many of the others who spoke this evening. The River Hills Alternative would impact the Susquehanna Riverlands, which is a Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources conservation landscape. The conservation landscape partners work to improve public access to the river, preserve environmentally sensitive areas in the forested river landscape, improve water quality, provide additional recreational opportunities, and revitalize the river town communities. The Susquehanna Riverlands conservation landscape evolved from a large scale utility land protection project, which was initiated in the 1990s with national, state, local government partners, as well as private and nonprofit. Groups. It included, included in these lands is the Shanksbury Wildflower Preserve, which was transferred to the Lancaster County Conservancy on April 30, 2014. The Shanksbury Wildflower Preserve, which is the subject of this application, PF 14-8-000, was also the subject of PF 1881-066 and resulted in a FERC decision at 141 FERC 62,226 issued on December 21st, 2012. In ruling to remove the Shanksbury Wildflower Preserve from the FERC boundary for transfer to the Lancaster County Conservancy, the FERC stated that the ruling would, quote, contribute to a state and regional programmatic effort that has been endorsed by several federal agencies in addition to numerous state and local entities. In ruling on whether removal of the land was in the public interest, the FERC stated, quote, in summary, the conservation initiative in agreement with the Fish and Wildlife Service offers significant and binding land conservation and protection measures. These conservation measures should ensure that these lands are protected and made available to the public in the future. The River Hills alternative, if adopted as the final route, would eviscerate the FERC decision made less than two years ago. That decision supported the Susquehanna Riverlands Conservation Landscape and permitted the transfer of these lands for protection and public use. I urge the FERC and Williams to continue to consider the environmental impacts on forest land, the uniqueness of Lancaster County and all of its resources, the role of our less than 50% forest land in protecting clean air and water for humans, other species, and for providing recreation, scenic vistas, and public areas. I respectfully request that Williams and the FERC permanently abandon the River Hills alternative and conduct a full and fair total inquiry into the environmental impacts on Lancaster County. Thank you for your consideration. Good evening. I'm Karen Martinick, M-A-R-T-Y-N-I-C-K, and I'm the Executive Director of Lancaster Farmland Trust. You have the difficult job of determining the impact a pipeline will have on natural resources, and I'm here this evening to talk about one specific natural resource that is unique to Lancaster County. Lancaster County has the most productive non-irrigated soils, farmland soils, in the country. And Lancaster County, as a government and as a community, has dedicated almost $200 million of taxpayer money to permanently preserve Lancaster County farmland. In addition, individuals, businesses, and foundations from around the country have contributed tens of millions of dollars to protect Lancaster County's unique landscape and productive agricultural soils. In fact, 25% of all Lancaster County farmland is currently preserved. That translates into about 1,200 farms or 1,200 farm families who have given up millions of dollars of potential development value in their land to ensure that that land will be forever protected 
and that they will be able to continue to make their living and future generations will be able to farm as they have. Lancaster County leads the nation in farmland preservation. More farmland has been permanently protected here than in any county in the United States. Over 110,000 acres of preserved farmland. By their own acknowledgement, Williams has never sighted a pipeline in an area with as much permanently protected land as they are facing here in Lancaster County. And they do not know the consequences of doing so. Landowners who have placed a conservation easement on their farms did so to provide permanent protection from industrial and commercial development and now find themselves with essentially commercial operations, industrial operations on their farms. The conservation easements on their land legally ensures the protection of the conservation and agricultural values of their lands. Running a pipeline through Lancaster County has the potential to impact more than 50 farms. We don't know exactly how many farm preserved farms it will impact because we've been unable to get a, a, uh, an exact route from Williams. But we know that between 50 and 60 farms are along the proposed routes that Williams has provided for us. It's interesting to me that if a farm is preserved using federal dollars, in fact, it cannot be condemned and you can't put a pipeline across it. It specifically states in, the, in easements that are used by the federal government that pipelines are prohibited. It's interesting to me that you as a federal agency are now considering approving a project that will take a pipeline across preserved farms when in fact if those farms are preserved with federal dollars, that pipeline can't go across those farms. How then is it different if the, this community has spent their hard-earned dollars to preserve farmland? How is that different than using federal dollars to preserve farmland? Why is it okay to put it across land that's been protected by the hard-earned dollars of the people in this audience, but it's not okay if the federal government funded it? Research shows that it can take decades to restore the ecological balance of the soils that the farmers have worked so hard to produce thereby diminishing the conservation and agricultural values of the preservation that the preservation is intended to protect. Your role is to determine that the basic test of whether or not this pipeline is required as public convenience and necessity. This pipeline is not necessary, and this community does not want it. And these farmers whose, pipe, whose land you will run this pipeline over have permanently protected their land, and they deserve to be heard by you, and they deserve to have their land protected from the pipeline and from everything else that they have, they have worked so hard to protect. Thank you. I am a fisherwoman, by the way. They do exist. Uh, my name is Kara Longacre Hurst, C A R A, do I spell my name? L O N G A C R E, last name H U R S T. I agree with all those have, who have spoken against the uh, proposed uh, pipeline by Williams. Um, and I have, I'm just going to mention um, two things. Uh, the first is a frustration that I have regarding the exports. I have been trying to find information as to how much gas is proposed to be exported through this line um, if it goes through Lancaster County and it's very difficult to get information. I have asked Williams in the open house and I have not gotten a direct answer to the percentage of the gas that will be exported. I think if this gas line is going through people's properties, if we are to sacrifice our land, and our preserves and our farms, we deserve an answer to what percentage of the gas will be exported to Cove Point. They, they have admitted in a 
question and answer article written by Ad Crable on July 6 in the in the Lancaster paper that through the Transco line, this pipeline will this pipeline will be connected to Cove Point. When asked by the person that wrote the question, however, how much will be exported, they skirted the question and did not answer that question. So that is my point on the exports. We, Williams needs to be transparent as to how much of this gas is going to be exported. Because the point is that they, they say that it's for use of uh, Eastern markets. Well, how much? What is the percentage? We need to know. The last point I want to make is regarding the Pennsylvania Constitution. This pipeline proposed by Williams it, as it appears that we are to sacrifice our land, our nature preserves, our farmland, possible decline in property values, and our safety in addition to all of the concerns mentioned here. Is this the intent of Article 1, Section 27 of the PA Constitution? It reads, the people have a right to clean air, pure water, and to the preservation of the natural scenic, historic, and aesthetic values of the environment. Pennsylvania's public natural resources are a common property of all people, including generations yet to come. As trustee of these resources, the Commonwealth shall conserve and maintain them for the benefit of all people. I trust that you will respect the PA Constitution Thank you. I also call Judy Zinski. Is she on the other side? The what? I know I'm out of order, but isn't it strange that Williams people didn't stick around to listen to us? Thank you very much. I admire your, uh, your uh, stamina in listening to everything here tonight. I have nothing that I can add to the very complete comments that have been made to you so far, except to say that you should not approve this uh, permit. You should not allow a pipeline to be built at all through Lancaster County. But when we are talking about shifting it from sensitive areas of the county in the west, all we're doing is to shift it to somebody else in the county, and that is not right. <laughs> now, Williams has a route, and it's already been mentioned, and they will say, I know we, we can't do that because it costs too much. Well, now, the fact is, what happens when things, a corporation has an added expense? What do they do? They add it to the price. They charge people. And that is what they should do in this case, too. They should add it to all the other costs. They don't need to cut corners because all this is, is corporate. Uh, well, I wanted to say they're looking out for their shareholders, and that is the name of the game in today's world. Now, I have something else uh, before I close. I looked up the five commissioners of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission on the computer. Every one of them 
has either been directly employed by the energy industry, has been a, lo a lobbyist for the energy industry, has worked for the energy industry associates, associations, and it seems to me, in a way, that the cards are stacked against Lancaster County. I'm sorry to say that and I don't mean to offend you personally because I don't hold you responsible, but I hold our government responsible. It is not right for the federal government to take precedence over the local governments. And that's exactly what's happening in this case. If this pipeline is approved, there will be all kinds of ramifications and the people who live along it are going to have no voice in how this is put in. Now, there has been a very eloquent uh, plea for protecting our Earth, our Mother Earth. Friends, do you realize we depend entirely on the health of our Earth? If our Earth's health is in any way impinged, we and other species will be the sufferers. This whole business of taking gas out of the ground and transporting it around and especially exporting it is a case of injuring the earth. And it will be a long time, and if we are gone as human beings, nature will take itself back, but we won't be here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michelle Hippie. I'm a resident of West HIPPEY. I'm a resident of West Hempfield Township. I've lived there um, where I live now. Um, they I was born in a hospital, they brought me home, and I've been there pretty much all my life in the same house. So, um, first and foremost, I, the pipeline is not running directly through my property. At least I kind of thought it wasn't until I went next door and was looking over the maps and it's not running, that green line is not going through there, but there's a dotted line through my property. And I said to the gentleman, I said, what's this dotted line through my property? He said, oh, well, that's where we got permission to go on your property. And uh, that's another possibility that we could go through there. And I said, um, wait, no, we, we didn't give you permission. Well, yeah, and it's, no, we didn't. Uh, and no, we never, never got any um, papers or anything about that. So, you know, that's kind of being right there off the start. That's not good. <laughs> you know, we, we never got anything. You never asked and trespassing right there. That makes me feel uneasy. And he said, well, maybe the next time we'll get permission. And I said, hmm, I don't think so, okay? So, <laughs> and you mentioned about environmental effects. Well, we live in a wooded area. I live close to Mr. Forey. Uh, there's, there's been so much building in, around the area that they've torn down uh, all the woods. Uh, we probably have the last surrounding um, wildlife in that area. Um, there'd be loss of a lot of wildlife, beautiful deer. Um, there's actually eagles in our backyard. If I open my back door, there's, there's, there's deer, eagles. I mean, they live there. They don't fly from the Susquehanna River and come and catch the rabbits and fly back. They, they live there. <laughs> there's, um, you, you name it, fox, beaver, birds, egrets. There's marshland back there where they want to put the pipeline. Um, just all kinds of tiny critters, um, you know, anything. Uh, there's, um, my great nephew says there's a bear. I don't think so, but uh, <laughs> hey, his imagination. <laughs> but, um, there's generations have grown up there and you know it, it'd be nice for 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 the generations to grow up and not have to see these animals just in, in a book or in, in the zoos you know that people we, we all like to go through the woods and, and and walk and see all these animals you know something we, we we've always enjoyed and we still want to enjoy so um, and, and Murphy's Law takes effect here because I know the sewer has recently been put through there, believe me, I know, and, and uh, believe me, what, when they say um, 
could never happen happens. I personally had something happen with that, and uh, Murphy's Law does take effect there. And uh, the, the water line there has been in there for years and years, probably at least 40, 45 years or longer. And um, there's a consideration there, too, that, that those will be below the pipeline. What happens then when those need replaced? Um, what, do you, what do you do there? Uh, and, you know, how long will the road be closed for construction? Things like that. Um, all this needs to be taken into consideration. People need to get to work. Um, yes. Yeah. So, uh, all, all, you know, all these things need to be answered. I mean, it's, you just, people, mostly people in that township have lived there because they want to live there for years. They enjoy it. It's country. It's rural. And they've lived there for generations, as a few of us that live there have mentioned. And uh, I thank you for the opportunity to, to speak. And I think um, we would just like to keep it that way. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Kevin Hurst. Last name spelled H-U-R-S-T. Thank you for this opportunity to, uh, again, hear from me. Um, we live in what was the initial sites of this uh, pipeline. It has since been moved from our property, but I do understand that it could come back. And I'm concerned about that. Um, I was told at the last open house meeting that Williams was here, um, and this has to do with you all, and it's just my observations from an outsider looking at this process. I was told that if you, as an agency, FERC, were to grant uh, approval of this project, knowing that it was going through, for example, earthquake-prone areas, that your agency would not hold, be held liable in any way or form for if there was an earthquake that happened. It seems to me that a more judici judi judicious decision-making um, process would be if FERC too could be held liable and accountable for granting unprecedented sized pipelines through a known earthquake prone area, that somehow you also bear some of that responsibility as a, as a sanctioning agency. Thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Luke Bunning. I live in Conestoga. Um, I have two requests of uh, FERC to ask Williams to give us information on. One is well water. Uh, both Mardik and Conestoga Townships rely heavily on well water. Uh, in fact, I don't think we have any public water. Um, and I'd like some kind of uh, guarantee that there would be uh, a documentation of the underwater or the underground aquifers to all of our well waters and then uh, some kind of guarantee that that well water uh, will not be affected by the drilling, blasting or any other form of disturbance of the soils. I also uh, request that um, there's some kind of guarantee given to homeowners. Uh, we've had multiple cases of homeowners uh, finding out from their insurance agents that they will not be covered if the pipeline goes through their property. Um, Williams has said that they've never heard such a thing. I think that's because they haven't done greenfield um, expansions before. Uh, so what we're finding is homeowners are now faced with uh, sitting on a time bomb uh, without insurance on their home, and that then makes it impossible for them to get a mortgage on the property to sell the home. So um, I'm not sure the right legalese way to ask for it, but if you could please ask Williams, to give some kind of assurance that the people that just want to get out of the way of the pipeline can do so without losing their shirt or having to downgrade the property that they were used to live on. That would be fantastic. Um, and, uh, you know, Mr. Stock, well, I'll just wrap up with one kind of general thing that Mr. Stockton had stated uh, from Williams on NPR that the expansion will not affect the amount of gas serving our area. Uh, we've talked, I'm sure lots of people here have talked about, yeah, 40% of the gas is going to be overseas. Uh, to Cove Point, and uh, I understand that public necessity and convenience is uh, defined in many different ways, but I really beg you guys as FERC to uh, take that to heart and really look and see who is benefiting from this. 
uh, whether it's just one company in Tulsa uh, or if it's uh, Japanese or Indian uh, residents because we're really assuming a lot of risk here for them and uh, I'd appreciate it if the risk we're assuming this for was truly serving uh, Americans and uh, the people you're uh, designated to protect. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Michael Helfrich. I'm the Lower Susquehanna Riverkeeper. I'm sorry, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-E-L-F-R-I-C-H. -E I'm the Lower Susquehanna Riverkeeper. I work for an organization called Stewards of the Lower Susquehanna. <clears throat> I do wanna address some of the scoping issues, but before I do, I wanna say that categorically we oppose this pipeline on the principles that the pipeline construction will cause environmental damage during the construction and over its lifetime and provides no benefits to the citizens whose right to enjoy and profit from their property will be taken away. Uh, Ms. Kerrigan, you spoke at the beginning and uh, asked us for the reasonable alternatives. And so that one's pretty easy. There is no pipeline for Lancaster. Uh, I will try and make the rest of my comments brief. We've already heard the uh, compelling and logical arguments of uh, all the speakers tonight. I want to speak a little bit. Um, a lot of my work has to do with water, and I have come before FERC uh, before. Um, and FERC, I'm sure, is familiar with the Chesapeake Bay uh, TMDL lawsuit and requirements upon the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And through the Chesapeake TMDL, we are being required to reduce sediment and nutrients that are coming off the land from different uses. And in the Chesapeake TMDL, there is no allocation for growth for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. That means that every activity that could increase sediment or nutrients into our waterways has to be offset somehow. Now, I've been reviewing what's happening up in the Marcella Shale region and some of the other pipelines. Um, the Spectra pipeline was approved uh, over in York County recently within the last few years. Um, so let me start with some of the impacts from that. Um, as soon as you're out there doing the construction, you are changing the land uses. The first thing is the construction, you're digging it up, the erosion and sediment controls are a joke. As soon as it rains, that stuff overtops the sediment fences and the, and the sediment socks. And I watched just as tons and tons of sediment went into the tributaries of York County and then down into the Susquehanna and the Chesapeake Bay. I think it must be a requirement for any construction that FERC include and dictate the offsets so that Pennsylvania, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, will not be responsible for that. This is a federally approved project if you approve it, and therefore the federal government and uh, President Obama's order regar regarding the Chesapeake Bay TMDL should take over and FERC and, and or the Department of Transportation should be required then to fulfill these offset obligations. I see that was a quick three minutes, so I will just uh, conclude by saying uh, fragmentation of wild areas. This can, cannot be really helped. These invasive species come in. I will ask for one other type of mitigation and that on Williams' uh, pamphlet on sh river and stream crossings, it points out FERC's three different categories of streams, minor, intermediate, and major. Um, in fact, in Lancaster County, as the member of Donegal uh, Fishing group uh, said earlier, it's the small streams, it's the trout streams that need to be protected. So they are the ones that need horizontal drilling, um, horizontal directional drilling, and it has to include the wetlands and the buffers as well. If you destroy the buffers, you destroy the trout streams. Not to mention a lot of those buffers were paid for by individuals and the state of Pennsylvania and the federal government. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak.
Hello, my name is Beth Katz, um, K-A-T-Z. I'm a homeowner living a couple of miles from the proposed pipeline path. I'm a recreational user of the woods and trails in Lancaster County and especially Manor Township. I'm pleased that for now, the pipeline has been diverted around our irreplaceable natural resources. Okay. Um, but I don't want this pipeline built. Um, it doesn't need to be built. But I realize that companies often convince governments to allow projects that the population doesn't want. I consider myself a steward of this land. Dirt is not just dirt. Our soil is not ordinary soil. Washington Borough, which is my mailing address, um, is known for its remarkably tasty tomatoes. Okay, <laughs> okay, lots of you know that. Okay, yes. <laughs> um, I, I hope you've had an opportunity to try some. I didn't bring any to throw. I didn't think that would be a good idea. Okay. Um, yeah, no. <laughs> um, Lancaster County soil is good, productive soil. Okay, because of that, we've preserved so many farms. Okay. A few years ago, my neighborhood was forced to connect to newly, cre newly created sewer lines. They had to blast through rock a few feet down in my front yard to put in that line. I have video. Okay. After those lines were installed, our yards were supposed to be restored to the way they were. The dirt used to fill in was nowhere near as good as the soil that they took away. It has different composition, more rocks, more weeds. It isn't as hospitable to earthworms. It is not the same kind of dirt. It was dirt and not the fertile soil that was removed. If I were a farmer with fields of wonderfully productive Lancaster County soil that have supported my family for so many years, I'd want assurances that my soil would be restored. My soil. Not soil trucked in from somewhere else. My soil. To do this, if you have to build this, FERC should require that the company set aside and preserve at least a foot of the topsoil from each location along the pipeline's length so that it can be replaced where it was removed. Okay. Our soil is a precious asset. It's not just dirt. We have a responsibility to care for the precious natural assets we have. Don't destroy them. Don't build this pipeline. Thank you. Hello, my name is Joanne Callahan, J-O-A-N-N-E, Callahan, C-A-L-L-A-H-A-N. I'd like to thank you all for sitting through our comments and considering the things that we'd like to share with you. One of the things that I would like to discuss is relative to the easements that have been talked about here. In particular, in Lancaster County, what's been important regarding this pipeline are conservation easements for protection of native areas and also conservation easements for protection of farmland. Now, um, if you haven't dealt with conservation easements before, I think it's important to understand that these are um, systems that are recognized by the um, Internal Revenue Service that has standards that apply in terms of when you have a conservation easement, what has to happen. And um, one of the things that has to happen is that the property that's put under a conservation easement is protected in perpetuity. You have to make that guarantee and you give rights to another organization to oversee that protection and make sure that the property remains protected forever, basically. Um, that promise is that you're not going to develop it, you're not going to use it in a way that's adverse to the special qualities that that property has. It seems fairly clear that putting a pipeline on the preserved farmland as well as the preserved native areas is contrary to that type of approach, that you won't develop it and you're protecting it for the, for the use of the public good. As a result of taking your property and putting it under protection, you get a charitable contribution deduction from the Internal Revenue Service. And that deduction with respect to agricultural property is something that can be deducted for up to 15 years, depending on the time period that you made that contribution. So one of the questions that I would have in terms of looking at running a pipeline through some of our protected farmland is, how do you value that protection? I mean, how do you value the loss to the, to the landowner of the charitable deduction 
as well as the fact that under the Internal Revenue <coughs> Code, <coughs> excuse me, you, you are required to also compensate the overseeing organization as well as lenders who may have an interest in the property. So I would direct you to um, Internal Revenue Code Section 170 to look at that um, in more detail. Additionally, um, I would say finally that, that your role under NEPA, I think, does coincide with the interests of the people of Lancaster County to, pr to make a decision in accordance with the will of the people. I think there's been a tremendous amount of information to show that there is a detrimental impact to air, water. There's not been a discussion of children's health except by the doctor, but I think it's important to look at the cumulative impacts as well as um, environmental justice. We have minority communities, we have Mennonite communities that are not on the internet, who are not getting you know the local news all the time. We have 40% Hispanic population in town, in addition to the Indian population that was there. I, I know that um, the other thing that I would like to mention is I'd like to ha ask FERC to consider the cost to natural, natural resource restoration, which is often considered in terms of um, the NEPA considerations and um, looking at what the cost will be in terms of the future. So I thank you for your time. Good evening, my name is Sarah Holton, Sarah with an H, H-O-L-T-O-N. Good late evening. I am a homeowner, wife, mother, and educator in our community, community that's extremely invested in our community. I live in the Bridge Valley development in West Hemfield Township that includes approximately 250 homes, not people, homes, Many that are impacted by the survey, hazard, blast, or fire zone as calculated by FERC and the Williams Company. I am personally, our home, um, family home, is five houses away from the proposed pipeline construction area. I ask FERC to seriously consider the following concerns. The pipeline will directly impact the following in the Bridge Valley development, aside from homes and families, with the construction of the pipeline. First is our covered bridge. It is a historical landmark. It is registered on the National Register for Historic Places, structure number 8000-3512. The construction directly goes through our Farmdale pumping station um, that is run by LASA, Lancaster Area Sewer Authority. The construction goes directly through our floodplain. The construction and pipeline will go directly through the Chickies Creek. The surrounding watershed is a protected watershed program for the Chesapeake Bay by the PADEP, as well as local watershed protection programs. West Henfield Township supervisors have proposed an alternative route to minimize the impact if this project gets approved and are awaiting a response from the Williams Company. Long after Williams is gone, we must deal with the repercussions of this project on our land, families, water, and well-being. Is it worth it? Furthermore, oftentimes in history, um, we witness catastrophic events involving people, land, and economy, and we ask, where was the foresight? To those at FERC, you have the ability now, the precious ability to have and act with that foresight for the people for our homes and for our land. And I look forward to the action you will take. Thank you. for this opportunity. My name is Frank Schaller, S-C-H-A-L-L-E-R, and I'm from Philadelphia. 
the uh, founder and director of Soil Food Health Forum. And I have a lot of friends and family in Lancaster County and farmers that I go to for food to take back to Philadelphia. Today in the 21st century, there is acid mine drainage pollution in Europe from mining done by the Romans over 2,000 years ago. Today, 30% of the oceans are acidic. Today, Pennsylvania has over 4,000 miles of streams with dead zones where nothing can grow or live. The list of fossil fuels, health and environmental damage seems endless. All fossil fuels industry, including natural gas, causes damage and is killing people. My written statement will have references. Given these facts, we must shift from all fossil fuels to renewable sources of energy. Not to do so would be like the diabetic, addicted to sugar, ending up blind on dialysis and eventually losing one or both legs, having them amputated. Our policymakers must guide the fossil fuel industry, including natural gas, to make the transition from fossil fuels to renewable sources for energy, which there are many. These pipelines mean more drilling and its consequences. These pipelines mean more addiction to fossil fuels. These pipelines are not for the benefit of Pennsylvania or American citizens, but to sell Pennsylvania natural gas on the international market. Infrastructure corporations such as pipeline manufacturers and companies that lay pipelines need now to look for ways to restructure their business from fossil fuel energy support to renewable energy manufacturing. We the people do not need more pipelines. We the people do not need to drill more gas wells. We, the people of Pennsylvania, do not need to sacrifice the health and safety of our children to send Pennsylvania gas around the world. I will end with two questions. What is the carbon footprint, including all infrastructure support and external costs of one gas well? What is the carbon footprint, including all the infrastructure support and external costs for laying this pipeline project? Please listen to we the people and stop the pipeline. Let us leave something for our children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Hi, uh, my name is Kimberly Kahn, K-A-N-N. I am a longtime resident and uh, landowner in Conestoga. Um, I own a small family farm and also have financial interest in a couple other properties that are directly along the pipeline path. I also happen to be a member of the Education Committee of the Lancaster County Conservancy and was initially appalled at the, um, the, the, the plan to compromise conservancy properties with the initial pipeline route and then was um, even more panicked to find out that my family farm was to be dissected by the pipeline route, the second proposed pipeline route, essentially cutting it in half and destroying the only tillable acreage left on a partially wooded site. Um, I had a long list of things that I wanted to address tonight that were far more eloquently expressed by other people. I wanted to address concerns about soil quality, seismic activity, biological diversity, archaeology, air quality from the inevitable release of methane gas, which is, as far as I know it, the most dangerous greenhouse gas. Um, insurance issues that are very real, and um, also the potential option of retrofitting existing routes. What I'd like to talk to instead, at the, hopefully to save some time this evening, it is a, a very personal perspective. Um, the area of the proposed second proposed pipeline route um, goes through the property that my family owns and crosses a spring-fed fed stream that provides our domestic water supply. How can we be assured of the safety of our water will, be not, will not be compromised and how will we be, we be compensated for it if it is and for how long? 
our family is facing a catastrophic decrease in property value. This land, proposed to be dissected by the pipeline, represents our largest financial asset. No person in their right mind would want to purchase a property that has, that has the potential to explode violently, admittedly risking the life of any resident nearby. How will we be financially compensated for the loss? Logically, the prop property decided, or dissected by a giant pipeline cannot be sold for anything near to the current property value. The only other alternative to selling it at a catastrophic loss is to live there, is for my children to live there, in a home that is at risk of violent explosion. It is in the hazard zone, the house and every outbuilding on the property. Potential emergency scenarios include a published danger zone that encompasses everything. My entire family could be wiped out by an explosion. How would you guarantee the safety of and protect the lives of my children? And how could Williams or you possibly provide compensation if you're wrong? And by the way, the amount of free, non-polluting solar energy that falls on U.S. land daily far exceeds the 24% of our energy needs that are met by the natural gas industry. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kenny Holton. You've already talked to my wife, Sarah Holton. So the last name is H O L T O N. Uh, as she expressed, we, we live in the Bridge Valley community, and it's one of the, the major things that uh, brought us to that community when we moved there about four years ago was being able to go out on our deck and see the beautiful covered bridge, that's, which sits about adjacent to our house. And it's also the covered bridge that will be affected by this pipeline. It is very close to where the pipeline is being dug, is where this pipeline will, will be. And as she stated, that is a uh, registered bridge under the Historical Society, structure number 8000-35. One, two. And I also wanted to state I am very appreciative that you have taken the time to speak to all of the residents in this area. And I know it's been a long night, and I know there, there are a lot of other voices that wanted to be able to, to, to speak up during this meeting, um, but due to time constraints, wouldn't be able to do so. I know that there are many other voices within the Bridge Valley community that would love to be able to. to talk about their families, to be able to speak about uh, the lives that they've created in that community and how this will be affected by this pipeline. There are many that are concerned about the, their property value as well as their, uh, the livelihoods that they have created in this neighborhood and the safety of what this project will, will do to their, our neighborhood. I've attended the, the informational meetings that were held by Williams, the one that was in the Acorn Farms, and was lucky to be one of the people that were able to go inside as they turned many of the people that attended the meeting away at the door. I've seen the maps that directly affect my neighborhood, and I'm sure you can imagine my concern that my house on Heather Lane was on that list as being inside the burn zone. It's a terrifying aspect in the, the have something like that in my neighborhood, especially when I have a young 21-month-old son that I, I've created this life for him. I, bought, I want this to be his forever home, and I want this to be a, something that he can come back to, and this is something that would detriment our lives and, and is a great concern to me. Thank you again for being able to, to speak with us, and I just hope that you take all this information to heart. Thank you. Hello, my name is Brenda Barnes, B-A-R-N-E-S. Um, I'd just like to point out right now that everyone who has come up here to speak 
um, has been very strongly against this pipeline. I was expecting that maybe a few people would come up in favor of it, but please note that it has all been pleading with you to not have this pipeline come through Lancaster County. Uh, I am a mother, I'm an environmentalist, I don't have any degree in that, I'm just a tree hugger. I believe that all people have the right to clean air, clean water, clean soil in the sanctuary of their own home. We need to leave the future generations an earth that's cleaner than what it was when we inherited it. And I just have a few notes here. Um, one, we should be moving away from fossil fuels. Why are we building more pipelines? Fossil fuels are finite, they are temporary, and they will run out. Lancaster County has the best soil in the country. It's a fact. Um, reasonable alternatives were mentioned, moving towards renewable energy um, in the future of Lancaster County. There is a west wind that blows, I would say, 95% of the time. There's plenty of turbine energy available to us. Williams has a history of accidents. I have a newspaper here, Lancaster Journal. Uh, can't see the date. It was around the time of the last hearing here. Uh, to quote, but accidents do happen and a recent spate of, quote, unusual, close quote, mishaps at facilities owned by Williams, whose proposed Central Penn Line South Pipeline would pass through parts of western Lancaster County has triggered a federal investigation into safety practices at the company. I'm wondering what the latest is with this investigation. Hardly a company we should be allowing to come through Lancaster County. In response to the uh, US DOT's presentation earlier today, gas line systems may not cause explosions on highways, but they do blow up neighborhoods and lands and to quote the newspaper again, accidents do happen. Please, no pipeline in Lancaster County or any other county. Thank you.